about pattern formations. Um, and there are lots of questions one could ask, like um, in cellular automata, for example, you know, driving force has been how how much complexity do you need in the little in a little element that has local interactions in order to get complex behavior? Do you need a very complex element? Um, what's the minimum set? Um, if I gave you some minimum set, what's the space of patterns you can produce? And it's clear that that even very simple behaviors like game of life can produce a very large number um, of variety of behaviors. Uh, and people have also been very interested in modeling systems that they see. So um, for example, growth of crystals, uh, branching patterns in plants, is beautiful work, um, very old work by Linda Meyer, thinking about how you have predictable structure versus maybe unpredictable structure of, of crystals. So there's just a lot of work in computation thinking about pattern formation. Uh, more recently, it's come to the forefront um, partly because of things that we're trying to build. And I think I've brought my one and only prop, which is really, really small. It's like the size of a quarter. That's that little thing here. Because people are really building now tiny little computers with sensors and actuators and saying, well, what happens when I build thousands of these and I have identically programmed sort of cells? Now I throw them out and I want them to do something. Maybe there are bunches of robots. Maybe there, there are temperature sensors in your building. And I want to do something intelligent with those. Um, how do I start to think about that? Maybe there are robots that are built of little modules that self-assemble. All of these things are currently being built. Uh, and you know, the picture in the corner there is from Ron Weiss. Ron Weiss's thesis, eventually, maybe we are going to program cells to try and create complex pattern. So, a driving question in amorphous computing really has been how would we how would we engineer such systems? So it's a slightly different question from the cellular automata question or the question of modeling things we see in nature. But rather saying, you know, I have I want to build tons of pieces. Maybe they're at the scale of robots, maybe they're at the scale of cells. How would I engineer them? What would what program would I give them to produce a structure that I want? And so you can really take this maybe into two questions, one of which is, how do I get robust behavior without relying on the fact that I have to make perfectly reliable individuals, perfect individuals? Because if I do that, then I'm going to make very few, and they're going to be very expensive. I'd like to put a whole bunch, and then they have all, hopefully have those properties that are so common in biology that there could be turnover, there could be things breaking, there could be noise, and yet my global behavior is going to work. I'm able to stand here and talk even as my cells die. <laughs> right, so that's, that's one piece. Right? And then the second piece is, OK, so maybe I can get robust behavior, but that's not good enough. I want, I want behavior that I want. I don't, I don't actually want the game of life, unfortunately. <laughs> um, is it possible for me to say, this is the behavior I want, or, or maybe in, you know, if you really wanted to take the biology tech, it's a, here's my phenotype, give me the genotype. What should it be? Is there some way to derive that program from what I want? And here we're really looking for design principles that we can systematically apply to create pattern. Are there such design principles? Can we take such design principles, encode them as programming languages, and now have languages for talking about pattern um, that just produce for you these individual pieces? Um, and so what I want to convey in this talk really is, is this idea that there are ways of thinking about complex pattern that lend itself to solving both of these questions. The answer is not going to be the minimal set, the minimal number of states to produce a pattern. But it is going to be, here is a way of predictably producing a class of patterns. Here is how much states it's required. Here is how you could optimize it. Kind of like having a programming language for talking about windows and drop down menus that somehow is going to reduce down to add, subtract, put memory location here, and then do things like make it more efficient, even though it's not the minimal set. So what's an amorphous computer? Um, so if you're already familiar with cellular automata, it's pretty easy to go from that. It's a, it's a cellular automata where we give up the grid and we give up synchronicity. So there isn't a global clock that makes sure everything does things on particular times. Um, and we assume that things are, are randomly distributed. Um, if you're not familiar with Saratama, that's fine too. Um, maybe even better <laughs> than I can explain it properly. Each dot here represents, represents a computing element, that element that can sort of 
make computations has state, all of them have the same program, but they can differentiate in their state, and that's represented by them turning different colors. Um, not so far from biology, so I see tagging things with different colors is very popular. Uh, so in simulation two, we like we have a much wider range of colors. Um, each element communicates um, with a very small local set, so you can get information from um, close by space. Um, and let's see what else. Yeah, and, and as you said, space is much smaller than the overall space uh, that's occupied by these by these elements. I'm trying to think if there's anything there. Uh, hopefully that's that's it. They're identically programmed. They're not synchronized. So the assumption is they all have very similar speeds or clocks, but we can't sort of force them all to take decisions at, at particular times. Okay. All right. So let's say that we wanted to program a simple pattern on an amorphous computer. And here is a simple pattern, polka dots. Um, so, you know, apart from polka dots being a nice pattern to wear on your clothes, there's, there's lots of other reasons for polka dots. As you can see, it's really just another way of thinking about spacing. Right? How do I create structures in an undifferentiated space that have some minimal spacing between them? And for example, if you're thinking about these little, these little sensor networks, maybe what you want to do is create a, a routing network. And so individual pieces, you want to choose them at some spacing so that they will be the routing centers. So it's a very common thing to do in many different scenarios. OK, so, so what we're going to use in making this pattern is, um, is this very simple idea of using, of, of using a gradient or thinking about diffusion. Um, so suppose I had one particular element that is differentiated from the rest. And this turns as a source of some sort of gradient. And I'm going to say now that some of these slides that have nice animation-like looks were shamelessly stolen from Pam. Biologists make much better pictures in PowerPoint. <laughs> um, so anyways, this, so the assumption is that some cell um, can communicate a gradient of information. All that means is that this information decreases away from the source. And other elements um, here can test a concentration threshold or a threshold of this information and decide to go into one state or another. So maybe the ones that are green decide on our particular behavior. And we're going to use this for, for lots of different things. So this is basically a one piece that we can use. Uh, in an amorphous computer, what happens is this is implemented by passing messages that de decrement away. But in other systems, it may come for free, um, or it may take the form of actually things diffusing through space. OK, so, so here's a simple polka dot program. Um, all of the elements flip coins with some low probability, some cell flips a coin and, and gets, let's just say, head and then becomes uh, a source of, of this gradient. This gradient causes things nearby it to, it, it basically inhibits things nearby from ever becoming the source um, of another gradient. Right? So I've, in, I've missed, taken some space around me and cleared that of any, of any activity. And this goes on for a while, and eventually you get spots um, throughout this space. And you can you know, argue from this algorithm that what you're going to get is spots that have some minimum distance between them and that you're also going to get coverage, which is that every spot that is not one of these polka dots has to be within some minimum distance of a polka dot. Because otherwise, if it's not inhibited, then at some point it's, it would flip the coin and decide to become something. Um, and you could all see also how to increase the distance or decrease the distance between spots, uh, or maybe create larger spots. So we're starting to have some control over it. Um, and you know, if you really wanted to implement this, uh, there are probably very, very simple circuits that one can do, and there's a whole variety of circuits that are being built as part of the synthetic biology course, um, IP course, to try and, and have polka dots, essentially. So, so now we've got these, these polka dots, and it's a very simple program. And so the question is, oh, I guess I should mention what the pieces are. So the pieces I used, which is kind of important, is these are gradient, a threshold, a trigger, by trigger, I just mean some low probability coin flipping. Uh, and a piece of state. I'm assuming that somehow when you become a spot, you stay a spot. If I kill the spot, then things in that region might start competing again, and, and eventually something will become a new spot. 
Okay, so how much more complex are these? <laughs> Better yet, how much more complex is this? Right? Okay, so we'll start small. Um, suppose that I wanted to create an arbitrary pattern. Uh, and this is just a caricature of, of a CMOS inverter, one of the sort of pictures most commonly associated with amorphous computing. Uh, and the reason is because partially it's an asymmetric sort of picture. It isn't like polka dots where you might feel that, this, that the symmetry is, is too easy. How do we create asymmetric things? And it has a defined function so you can tell when your pattern actually fails. So suppose that this is the pattern that I want to create. Right. Well, I can give you an idea of how to create that pattern um, if it was done on a sheet of paper. So I might say, well, I'll take a sheet of paper and I'm going to name each of the sides of this paper. And I'm going to say the following. I say, well, draw a line between the left-hand side and the right-hand side and call that line V1. And then between V1 and the left-hand side, draw another line, call that V2. Between V1 and E23 or whatever, the right-hand side, draw another line. Um, and then between these lines are some regions. So between the left hand and V2 is, is a particular region. I'm going to call that in. Right? And so I can put this in regions. And then I can talk about lines um, that fell within certain regions or not. So maybe the top part of the inverter is a line that is in the top region. I sort of miss the part where you make regions in the horizontal direction. So I've kind of created a grid, and in this grid, told you how to put a pattern. Okay, so this is, this is a program for drawing an inverter, right? And what I really used is a set of construction rules um, from actually origami. And, and it's basically a set of mathematical rules for how to, to draw a very large class of patterns. Um, so these are equivalent to, say, a ruler and compass, um, Euclidean uh, sort of Euclidean geometry, you can get programs where you can draw a circuit and out from, you can draw this circuit and out comes that, a sequence of using these rules for drawing that pattern, right? So there's this small set of rules can actually describe a huge set of things that can be generated from lines and points. Okay. So now I want my amorphous computer to generate this inverter pattern. And what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to take each piece Rather than thinking, you know, how do I create this particular inverter pattern, I'm going to say, well, how do I mimic each of those rules? And if I can mimic each of those rules, then maybe I can mimic everything that can be created by those rules. And that's basically the idea. So it's going to start out the same way as, as my original sheet of paper did, which is that all of the elements have to say, get the same program. This program is derived from the inverter drawing, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But they start out in essentially a few states. So the left-hand side starts out in the left-hand side state and the right-hand side in the right-hand side state. Um, and those are just one bit, bit of states. So you could think of this maybe as placing determinants at the pole of your embryo. Right? And similarly, I have my dorsal and ventral as well. And it's always the same. No matter what pattern I draw, this is, these are my initial conditions. And what this means is that each element just has a state bit that says I'm A. I'm left. Okay, and now I can take each of my rules and, and implement them in some ways. So one of the rules is if I have two points, P1 and P2, then I can draw a line that is the bisector of the line between P1 and P2. So basically I can find the line such that any point on that line is equidistant from P1 and P2. That's basically what the geometry of this rule is. So how do I implement this on a morphous computer? Well, if P1 is the source of a gradient of some type, G1, and P2 is a source of another gradient, G2, then all of the elements in this thing simply test if the two things are equal. Right? Where equal is within some precision. These things are not very precise. They don't have that much spatial resolution. So I test if these two things are equal. If they are, then I must be of type of this line. Right? And now I've differentiated into this line. And this line can further be a source of another kind, another gradient. So the line itself could produce gradients. Um, so for example, if I have two input lines, what I get is cells that are along the bisector. Uh, and this is essentially the, the exact same program as the left one. It's just that the initial conditions are different. Okay? And so for similarly, we can implement other ones. Um, 
this is probably, <coughs> this is what the program looks like um, for the amorphous com computing elements. But the basic idea is very, is very simple. I'm just, if I were the individual element, I say, well, if I'm type A, I should produce something. If I'm type B, I pr produce something else. If I see G1 and G2, I compare them and see if they're equal. And then gradients themselves can also be used to end it. So for example, if you do decide that you're on the line, you produce a third gradient, and that gradient actually stops the sources from producing, producing gradients. So it's a very simple sort of logic, one that you could believe to implement. And so now the inverter program, which was really just a sequence of, of divisions like this, ends up being a sequence of rules that are exactly the same. Right? So it's not surprising that my previous program of development is now my program of development. It takes it, it segments the space, creates things within different compartments, and, and now I have my inverter. And it's very easy now for me to see how I could create other structures. So say that I wanted a chain of inverters. Well, my program is, is pretty much as you would think. Let me take my space and segment it into eight compartments, eight regions. In each region, make an inverter. And so my new program is only that much more complex than my previous one. And I could have said also, you know, instead of in every third one, create some other pattern, for example. OK, so, so using this idea, we can create a large number of patterns. This language was developed thinking about deformable sheets. Could we have deformable sheets that could take on different shapes? How, how would you think about the shape and result in a program that deforms? So there was a reason to producing lines, and the lines were regions where you would fold. Um, but 2D patterns are another place where you could use this. So one question might be, well, what's the cost of doing this? How much, how much information does each element need? And basically, you can derive that directly from your program. So you need a state bit per point, line, and region that you name. And that's the complexity. And so, so we can see that each, each piece of structure that you remembered as a state basically converts to a state bit. The number of rules is proportional, again, to the number of, of things in your sequence. Um, and there's a lot of use of gradients. But at any point in time, there really isn't more than three sort of gradients in, in, in use. And so if there's some way to forget information, so for example, I use two gradients to make some decision to find a line. As long as those gradients will decay, then later on I could use those very same gradients to make a different decision. And so in fact, you don't really need very many named chemicals, in a sense, to implement any of these things, as long as you have some way of getting rid of them. Um, so this is, this is sort of exciting from the amorphous computing point of view, is that we could take, for example, sensors or smart structures and sort of implement any pattern we want with very little effort to say, well, here's the pattern I want. You draw it. Out com compiles this thing. And I have some reason. I know that if I used less lines, I would need less state, for example. I had no idea how I'm doing on time. OK. So some other interesting properties emerge from this, um, and, and not really by accident, maybe just by things that we weren't really paying attention to in the start, is that how you choose to describe your pattern really is what's telling you the space of things that you can create with that pattern. So origami doesn't tell you how big a sheet to choose. And as a result, what you do is you create patterns that are relative to the boundary. So what that translates to is, is you end up trying to produce local rules that do things relative to the boundary. And so now, it's really the boundary that matters, not the number of elements. And so you automatically, no matter how complex a pattern you create, it scales automatically with size. And you can create many related patterns um, by essentially changing the initial configuration in which you ran the program. So now the program hasn't changed for any of these. Right? It's just simply dividing proportionally according to what it started with. Uh, and so you can see how maybe this would, this would be relevant as thinking about how you could have something very, very complex exhibit a property like this, where drastically changing the shape or size makes, makes really very little difference. OK, so, so the basic strategy was to, to find ways of describing patterns using construction rules, uh, and then compile those down. So here's just to show that this is a, a diff, very different kind of pattern and very different kind of amorphous computer. 
and show that you still use that very same strategy. So suppose that now my amorphous computer looks like this. I have an individual element, uh, and it has a program. And the things it can do is essentially grow or die. It can, it can well, as Drew pointed out, grow, not grow, or die. Um, it can produce children around it uh, without a lot of precision. So it produces it, but it ends up in some direction, uh, just not on top of other ones. Um, and it can choose not to do that, uh, or it can choose to die. And what I want to do is say, what, what's the program that I should give it to grow a given structure? So you give me the structure. How do I systematically produce a program? OK, so, <clears throat> so on the top, think of how you could construct a 2D shape. Okay, and this has, when you look at the top of this slide, the best thing is not to think about amorphous computers at all or, or any sort of thing like that. This is really like the geometry rules. I mean, you say, well, whatever pattern you want me to make, tell me how you'd make it out of circles. Pick some basic shape. And so here's how I'd make it out of circles. I might put down a circle and say, well, in the first circle, I'll create a little local coordinate system. And then uh, northwest about you know, 60 degrees, put a little point, uh, and that's going to be the starting of a new circle. And the new circle is maybe half the size of the, half the radius of the previous circle. And in my new circle, I'll say, well, there's, there's two uh, reference points here where the, it intersects the previous circle. Relative to those, I can place the point for a new circle. This new circle is maybe, again, a third of, of the radius of the previous one, and so on. And so I've built the structure out of placing overlapping circles and linking them through their own local coordinate system. Right. So my starfish really looks like, um, so each, each arm looks similar, obviously, but each arm can proceed together. So it's sort of like a partial order on how things should grow. I don't care which arm grows faster than the other, but in one arm, don't grow the end before you grow the middle. Uh, and so now what I've done is I've constructed a shape from, from circles. So I need to know how to create a circle. And I need to know how to elect re reference points. And those are my two rules. And any shape is really a set of rules like this, where there's one rule for each circle. So that's now my complexity. Uh, so the fewer circles I, I use, the better off I am. And so again, we can use some of the very sim similar ideas of gradients, random number generators, or coin flipping um, to implement these same things. So I can grow to a particular radius by having a gradient that stops at some level. Um, you use symmetry breaking to pick the initial set of coordinates. But after that, each other coordinate is gradients and testing relative strengths of gradients. Um, there's local competition to pick one that emerges as the best winner to start the next circle, and then the process keeps on going. All right, so, so I think the important thing here is that computer graphics has done this, does this all the time, which is to approximate arbitrary things as being made of, of polygons. So there are lots of algorithms that will do a very good job of trying to minimize the number of circles. Uh, it still so happens that sometimes when you do it yourself, you actually still do better because you recognize that things were somewhat symmetric. Um, and so this is, this is essentially how it looks. Each dot is, again, sort of this amorphous computer. And the, the colors represent different states. So red is sort of after decisions have been made. Yellow is when they're growing and competing. Um, points get chosen. Each time, it's going to be slightly different. And at a gross level, approximates the shape quite well. OK. And just to, just to sort of make the point that it isn't really, it isn't the specific pieces that are important. So it isn't circles that are important, and it isn't actually even growth that's important. So here's an example where we implemented this for um, a self-reconfigurable robot. So the idea is that you build robots out of these modules that can move around each other. Um, and you want to give these modules the same program, and you want it to approximate some shape. So we take a 3D sort of CAD drawing of some shape. We decompose it now into overlapping bricks. Um, again, we use very similar ideas for the bricks. And what happens is, is that the modules essentially, instead of growing, what they do is they recruit things that are near them. Right? But if there's nothing there, 
then they produce a gradient through the structure which attracts other wandering molecules that, that then, then migrate up this gradient and move into that space. Right? So things often migrate to the wrong part because that's a gradient. As it dies out, it migrates into a different piece. This is really not growth that, that was important, but it is sort of analogous um, to very much the previous example. Okay, I, this is sort of just to show that, you know, here there are other properties you could do. So scale independence is a kind of property. Um, so is self-repair. And we can encode design principles here that make it so that, um, I see. We exploit this to make create things that self-repair um, without thinking about self-repair each time. So, for example, in the case of the circles, you basically use something that embryologists have long called um, the rule of local neighbors. And they invented this term and this principle really to think about regeneration and understand why it is that certain kinds of, of things could be regenerated and to what extent cells really had information about where they were and how much of the structure had been lost. And the idea was that they really, the, the information only was very short distance, is that the absence of what you would think to be your normal neighbor causes you to do something. And when that comes about, its absence of its normal neighbor causes something else to happen. And the same thing is true here. So if we cut off an arm of the, of the starfish, the absence of the normal neighbor causes the normal neighbor to be formed, and so on. And so anything, again, you build out of this, you can get the same effect. And if you have two-way arrows instead of sort of the directed arrows I showed, then you get the starfish whose arm produces the body. And we can do this also for, for sort of topological patterns that I was showing before. Um, so just to, just to conclude, there's really been a large number of languages that have been explored, a lot of them very recently in amorphous computing. And the patterns range anywhere from space filling patterns to, um, to scale independent patterns from deterministic patterns that always produce the same thing to opportunistic patterns that are you know, using environmental cues to do things um, to self-repairing patterns. So it's really quite a diverse set and it's really still a very, very small space of what's known about patterns and a very, very small space of what's known about geometry. Um, what's interesting is for striking and at least surprising to me, was that all of these ended up being implemented by a very small set of things like gradients, um, cell to cell competition, um, very simple coin flipping, and just those same elements. There are four or five elements like this that we've used over and over again in all of this whole set, so no matter how diverse the set was. Um, and this has been very good because it means we can analyze those five and build them really well and, and think about those algorithms really carefully and then, you know, use them over and over again and not have to redo that work. And it, it will be interesting to see if, if that, in fact, can be true in synthetic biology um, because many of those pieces are in polka dots. And so polka dots sort of are maybe a first way of testing out can we build things. Maybe the next thing we can build is lines uh, and see how that goes. Okay, and so just to, just to conclude, um, you know, there have been a lot of people involved in the amorphous computing project, and um, I don't know what to say. So these are, these are a lot of the people whose, whose work's been presented here. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll go for questions. We have a couple here. First one. Um. <clears throat> Wow. So uh, origami, in the Japanese yeah. sense of the word, uh, has boundaries, the boundaries of the piece of paper. And so the first language you present is all about boundaries, whereas metazoan development is not necessarily all about boundaries. But that's fine. You do your starfish. Okay. So, 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 so recently I had a conversation okay. with Bill Gabbard. I'm going where, somewhere with this. Yeah. But okay. Keep, but okay. Okay. <laughs> go, go ahead. Uh, uh, Depends well, who, who you talk to, whether that's true. Yeah. Or no, not. We, uh, okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, one person's perception of developmental biology, but I'm trying to make generalizations mm -hmm. here since that's the best level to be useful at. Um, so you've gone to the trouble now of making two formal languages to describe shape building, and you've alluded to many other such efforts. So how quickly can you guys move to statements about the set of all shape building languages, of which um, then what biology is used will only be a subset? Uh, because if you can come up with generalizations about 
languages of this type that are sufficiently general, eventually they will subsume whatever metazoan development has stumbled across, and you'll be able to tell us kind of home truths about that which happened. Truth and glory. Um, so I've kind of avoided that, actually. Um, and it's, it's a hard problem. Mm -hmm. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. But also, I think there's a lot to be gained from looking at classes of patterns. So what if, I, what if instead of looking at metazoan development, I only looked at branching in metazoan development, all kinds of branching? And I said, are there rules there? Right? And maybe there are other rules for segmentation. Right? And maybe there is a language that subsumes them, but my first reaction would be to actually pick sets where I think they're related hmm. and look for languages that span those sets and then see if I can understand how you move from one to another and how much difference that would take um, before, before moving on to that. And, I, and I'm definitely not close to the space uh, of OK, then, then just one observation, too. Um, uh, you know, perhaps if you're developing a language, you think in terms of parsimony. Look at all these things I can do with such few basic uh, um, things to operate on. But of course, you know, that, that thing that is biology may not have been so parsimonious with her, uh, her gradients and molecules and mechanisms. She may have been lavish with those. Um, right. So, so if, if I talked instead to somebody who was building mechanical self-assembling devices, they would say, oh, you've been so lavish. Look how many state bits you've used. Mm -hmm. Because it really isn't the minimal set. Right? I've actually not tried to produce something that is parsimonious. So it's, it's sort of like saying, I can't pr I'm not going to produce the optimal. I want good enough. Right, so, so knowing what the limits are of your system is going to be very important to picking those languages. How lavish you can and cannot be. This is lavish with state, and it's lavish with communication. Right, so if communication is, is it's just not lavish with, with program size or, or something else. So there is trade-offs there. OK, we have one here, and then. So I have two questions in robot. Plasticity and so forth. So, as we heard this morning, so protein concentrations cannot be very well controlled. So, if you use gradient to do dissection, it'll be all over the place, right? So, we, so that's the first question. Okay. The second related question is: uh, uh, you have any schemes to keep the left wing of the airplane the same length as the right wing of the airplane? <sighs> it would be nice, right? Um, okay. So, so the first question is actually really good, really good because I didn't I didn't mention that. So. In the amorphous computing system, we place things randomly down. And gradients don't propagate through space. They actually propagate by hopping. What that means is that you actually, if you, if you looked carefully, what you get is something like this. You don't get a circle. So you get a lot, of, a lot of variation, and you get very low precision. So it turns out when you take two things like that, where you have limited precision, there are certain regions in which you can make very good predictions and other ones in which you can't. And so what the origami stuff does is actually stick in those regions. So if you have two sources of gradients, you actually can, with low error, tell where you are along the middle. But if you pick something behind, what you get is these bands that are very large regions of uncertainty. So you tend not to. So you can actually predict, um, even from a sequence, what, kind, what pieces would fail. So if I had two points very close and I tried to make a very long line, your line would diverge. Right. 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 And then it will move back and forth. And that's that's one of the ways in which this is really fundamentally different, and really needs to be thought about is is how you would how you would do that. Maybe you could put, for example, you could have the source have some sort of negative feedback that it doesn't produce more than necessary. It looks at the concentration and tries to maintain that. And then if you had five source cells versus ten you would still expect that your source tried to maintain a fixed concentration. That's certainly known to happen. And the uh, accuracy Pardon me? The, the, the oh. Um, right now, it doesn't really do anything to, to maintain that. It's, it's really the fact both are happening independently. You might think of ways to do that. But I don't have an answer for that one. We have one more question. So I just want to there and there. ask about uh, the, la the, la the, la the language, hi the language elements. So never mind all languages, but just just a few. Uh, the uh, I wonder. I'm curious how far we are, given given the flow of talks of the last day and a half. How far we are from enumerating the actually existing uh, elementary language patterns that generate uh, elementary language elements that generate that generate patterns. Uh, and 
and and and if so, uh, you know, as part of this engineering exercise, it actually try to enumerate them, and not just the doable ones that we could put in the parts list, but the ones that actually exist in the, in, in in real biological in the in the real biological yeah. world, and then from that, of course, try to see what's the what's the space of possible possible phenotypic consequences, and then the related evolutionary question would be the study of evolution that says. Uh, it, it, that, 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 that asks whether a discontinuous appearance of new phenotypic variation in the real history of biology correlates at the level of language elements to the invention of new language elements. Right. Right. One of the, I mean, I would lie to say I'm not interested in that, right? Because there's just too many, there's too many little pieces here that give you this tantalizing feeling like, I borrowed all this stuff from developmental biology, and what I got was, the ability to make little changes and have large morphological changes, the ability to get scale dependence, the ability to get self repair. Is it just is it just complete coincidence that this happened, or or is there really something interesting here? Um, one way in which you could look at that, for example, would be to look at branching patterns, because it's known that very small environmental changes can drastically change the branching patterns. And maybe there's some way there, I would think, of playing around and understanding are there really pattern rules that are being followed and what you're doing is, is tweaking the sequence of rules and producing very different patterning um, behavior as a result of, of a small set of rules. I think that would be one place where you could, could do that. But I won't be so ambitious to say <laughs> I can enumerate all of them. I was wondering if you think that genetic programming will be useful as you try to evolve from one pattern to the next or whether that's cumbersome in your system. Um, so, so I've taken a very different tack, obviously, from doing genetic programming, which is really almost uh, is, is thinking of compilers, right? Which is really, I just want to take the pattern and produce in a very stereotypic way. Um, one question would be if you really want to optimize, right? Is that this is, this is like a compiler takes your input and from that generates an output, and there's a direct relation between how you specified your input and the complexity of what you get out. Um, maybe we're not as good at optimizing, in which case it might be something that you could say, well, here's how you create a starfish, but could you really make it with less and start to evolve from there and see? So you could, for example, use evolution at the level of the rules and see if there are better ways of applying them to generate more optimized um, structures. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't really tried that. For now, it's, it's been very useful to be able to predict what's going to happen. And so any level of unpredictability starts confusing. So, you have one here. Um, my first question is in relation to the airplane that built itself. Where is the information encoded in that case? And secondly, I'm going to preempt your answer and imagine that it's in there somehow. It's programmed in there somehow. Whereas in some cases of biological pattern formation, the, the, the information isn't all encoded in the components. It arises from physics. It arises from, for example, surface energies, free energies. Um, it's not cl I wonder whether you're over-prescribing your system this way. It's possible. I mean, it's, it's also a very simple pattern, right? I mean, if I create a starfish that is a solid shape, that's nothing like a starfish. I mean, a starfish is much more than that little outline, right? So if I were to go to something more complex, I think definitely I would have to think a lot harder about you know, what's the right way to prescribe different pieces of the structure. But um, where here, is the the, here the information is in each pace. So, so it's very much taking the tack of you know, early Drosophila development where things are you know, pr producing gradients and producing lines or, or wing development where you're producing gradients and producing lines and not going as far as saying, well, what happens when you have gas relation? Why don't I have gas relation to think about something like this? Um, and just seeing how far we can get with a few pieces. Okay. You have a question over there? Yeah. So from an engineering point of view, if I can find a wavelet basis and use local rules to evolve a wavelet basis, so that's basically lots of spatial filters with low to high frequencies in a scale invariant way, then I can decompose any image you know, into a set of analog numbers in terms of this basis. And that will give me a very good approximation to any pattern that I want. And then I can soup it up at the very end with local finer rules. So could you think of, for example, in biology or something where you first evolve a set of basis patterns through time-dependent spatial diffusion like you have that give you th those things? Those basis patterns are stored in state. 
And then when you want to evolve an arbitrary shape, you're taking a weighted sum of them. You can even do a weighted sum of spatial diffusion patterns so that it evolves in time. You create it as you go. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Mm. I can't. Pieces of that I can relate to, but it's the last of the weighted sum, which is, is harder for me to, to well, think of an example, Well, essentially, the basis recreates any vector, right? And so now I've got a vector, which is your whole image. Right. So if I give you a universal basis that can recreate anything, all I have to give you is the basis components to recreate right. it. So right. I can approximate, since the wavelet basis approximates a lot of images fairly well, right. I can approximate any image with a finite set of basis vectors that are pretty good. So now the question is, if so now my program, right. really, for generating yeah. any image, is just the basis numbers, the coefficients of the basis. Now that's going to be approximate. Right, right, so right. I mean, just you the soup it up with a later with a local rule like you have, mm -hmm. like for example, if you get a fuzzy airplane, you soup it up at the end, right. at the end, by sharpening the wingtips and so forth. Okay, so. But, but what I'm saying is that that simplifies the programming because the programming now is. Okay, um, let me let me see if I can answer that quickly. So I haven't thought about that at all, and I won't okay. pretend like I can stand here and, and necessarily come up with it. But the circle. The circle representation is like that. It does. It is an approximation. It, you can pick the resolution you want, and you can fix the sides at the end. So that's kind of what we're doing. In any shape you draw, it's clear that you can pack it with circles. So, so whether or not, I mean, certainly it is the case in, in biology that a lot of patterns, patterns are made at a gross level and later on get refined. That's not at all under question. But how that later refinement relates to the first one is, is something I don't know for sure. And is different in many different cases. OK, let's, uh, yeah, let's uh, that's an excellent lead to a break discussion. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, but it doesn't stop there. There are many factors that biology has in material science that have us green with envy. And an example of that is shown here in this microscope photo of a stained living cell. And in this cell, bundles of actin fibers have been stained green. And what you can see is that um, this is a highly complex network of fibers. It's kind of a mess. Um, but one of the things that should be clear from this picture is that these, these fibers can assemble from point to point to point to point. They have the ability to start and stop from defined locations. And this is something that would be extremely valuable for circuit construction. Can we use these types of growth capabilities that actin fibers have to connect these protein fibers in between individual electrode contacts? And so again, there are um, additional projects in my lab uh, developing initiators and terminators for actin polymerization that can be used to build these types of circuits. So if you're interested in those types of projects, I'd be happy to talk to you uh, afterwards. Um, but I want to focus on today, though, is another capability that we have very little ability to address in nanoscience, and that is here. That is three-dimensional assembly control. Um, the best we can do, pretty much, is to do two-dimensional patterning, perhaps with lithography, and then build those patterns sequentially upon each other to come up with some kind of stacked array. Um, but biology, again, provides some very intriguing uh, building blocks for three-dimensional assembly, and these are the capsids uh, that, that provide the outer shell of viruses. And so most of you are familiar with these, but what they are is uh, genetic material, RNA or DNA, that's encapsidated by this protein shell. And what's interesting to us is this protein shell is made of a large number of identical building blocks, um, usually 60, or in the case I'll discuss today, 180 identical protein monomers self-assemble to form these icosahedral shells. Okay? So to me, that is synthesis. We have no way to make anything like that. Um, one of the properties that's very useful about this is they, they do this with monodispersity. Okay? This is another challenge in nanoscience. Not only are these particles in the right size for building things, they range from 8 to 100 nanometers in diameter, but these particles are all identical. Um, if you look in this electron micrograph, they all have exactly the same size, the same shape, and each one has exactly the same number of monomers that build them up. Okay? <laughs> so where we'd like to take advantage of this is they have another unique feature, and that is that they have the same exact functional groups on the exterior surface displayed in all the same positions. So what that means is if I can take this individual protein and come up with a chemical reaction to modify it, the new functional group that I introduce will be evenly displayed all over the exterior surface of this sphere. Okay? Um, we have been able to do that, and I'll show you the chemistry in a minute, but some of the applications that immediately come to mind is you can think about these as packing beads for very, very small chromatography devices. For, for instance, you could make these uh, nanoscale channels, 100 nanometers wide, for instance, that you could pack these small particles with. The high uniformity of the size would allow us to maybe uh, get good flow through those channels. You can also think about these as supports for catalytic reactions, and these are another area of prog uh, uh, projects that we're exploring in my lab. Um, but what I want to talk about today is the three-dimensional capabilities of these and the fact that we have another opportunity for synthesis. What if in addition to that exterior function group, I can develop another chemical reaction and put something on the bottom surface of this protein monomer? And if I do that, what I put on the bottom will be evenly displayed on the inside of this capsid shell, and that would lead us to a two-surface uh, assembly, a dual-surface assembly. And the application that we have in mind for that um, is to develop new types of vectors for drug and gene delivery. Um, viruses are natural gene delivery uh, vectors. Uh, what we would like to do in my lab is to reprogram the function of viruses in order to give them a new type of therapeutic uh, uh, ability. And so what we'd like to do, in short, is to take the genetic information, the RNA in our case, remove that from the core of the virus, and leave an empty shell behind. Um, the second part of this is we'd like to use our chemical reactions to attach uh, highly toxic anti-cancer drug molecules to the inside of this capsid. And these linkages are designed to be stable while this is going through the bloodstream, but they're destroyed very quickly under acidic conditions. So specifically, after these are endocytosed into the targeted cells, the lower pH conditions inside the endosomes and the lysosomes cleave these molecules off and they're released inside the cell. And so they're only active after uh, cellular uptake. Um, so a key component of this is that your immune system is very good at neutralizing viruses, which is a good thing. Uh, and so we have to take into account the fact that these uh, very complex protein surfaces make very nice surfaces for antibodies to recognize. And so uh, another part of our research is to coat the outside of these viral capsules with exterior modifications to put small polymers on the exterior here to make them resist antibody recognition. And there are a number of polymers in the literature that have been used for this purpose. In our case, polyethylene glycol is the most logical choice. This is a polymer that's known to inhibit protein-protein interactions, and this has been used to lower the immunogenicity of proteins in a number of examples. And so we thought we could evenly coat the outside of this hollow sphere with those polymers uh, and, and thus have them uh, have a prolonged circulation time. And then finally, there's another opportunity with these polymers. You see these red dots here at the external ends of those polymers. Um, that's where we envision attaching targeting molecules. And these are s additional small molecules that are recognized 
by receptors that are expressed on specific cell types. And these are what we'll use to guide our viral delivery vectors straight to the cells of interest. And the most common one that's used for this purpose is folic acid. Uh, tumor tissue upregulates folic acid receptors. And so it's been shown in numerous studies that if you coat something with many copies of folic acid, uh, it is directed to tumor tissue specifically. Okay, so to put this all together, what we hope to have is a system that can direct highly toxic drug molecules specifically to tumor tissue, and it would avoid exposure of those molecules to your healthy tissue. So there are three levels of, of uh, technology we need to do for this. We need to come up with the external modification, the removal of the genome, and the interior modification. And we've been able to do all three of these at this point, and that's what I'll walk you through in the next couple of slides. Um, so our target for these studies is bacteriophage MS2, and we heard about this this morning. Bacteriophage MS2 uh, was the coprotein monomer that was binding to RNA, and some of the studies were tracking RNA in cells. Um, in our context, we're interested in the fully assembled variant, now, MS2 is a very simple virus. Uh, it has a genome of 3,500 nucleotides of single-stranded RNA. And this is encapsulated inside this 27 nanometer sphere, which is made of 180 identical protein subunits. Okay. Um, this virus only infects E. coli and infects specific strains of E. coli, and so it is, in fact, harmless to humans, and so it's a very easy virus to work with in the lab. And currently, we can culture this virus and get about 30 milligrams of pure virus per liter of broth. And we've actually made no attempt to really up that, that yield. That's fine for our purposes so far. Um, in terms of the capsid structure, um, this is, if you focus on these six points around here, you can see a hexagon. Can everybody see that? Okay. And if you expand this out, this is how the protein monomers are packed in the, out, in the, the protein shell. And I've highlighted in light blue and dark blue, which may not come out too clearly, uh, two of the individual protein monomers. Those are the two proteins that, that were binding RNA. Um, so you can see how these are assembled in these circular arrays, and you notice that there's a hole in the center of this. And that's one of the things that we are attracted to in MS2. Um, this has 32 pores in the capsid shell, which are 2 nanometers wide. Okay, and so we thought, well, this would make it much easier. We have to somehow get our molecules, our drug molecules, such as Taxol here, inside the capsid, attach them to the shell, and then later on get them back out. And we thought, well, if this had pores in the shell, we'd be able to do that without having to worry about taking the thing apart. It makes our life a little simpler. Okay. Um, in terms of functional, uh, functionalization of the virus, the first step was to remove the genome. And um, we came up with some pretty simple conditions to do this. Um, what we do is we take our MS2 vi uh, viral particles. We then treat these at pH 11.7, very precisely, actually, um, for two hours. And then we do a peg precipitation, which recovers the protein. And we repeat this process. And what we envision would happen here is that the high pH conditions would cause the RNA inside the capsid to degrade. It would be chopped up into smaller and smaller pieces, and eventually, perhaps, the individual nucleotides would come out through the pores in the capsid, and that would leave an empty shell behind. And in fact, this works. Um, in my lab, we've been able to do this with greater than 80% protein recovery each time we do it. And you can see here by the UV trace, um, you start with this predominant 260 absorption, which is characteristic of RNA molecules. After this treatment, you only have a 280 absorption, which is only the protein coat that remains. And perhaps more satisfyingly, we can look at this by TEM. Um, here you see the viral particles stained with urinal acetate. After our treatment, you can see the stain penetrates to the inside of the shells. And so we have hollow capsids behind. Okay, so these are our little capsules that we want to put our drug molecules inside. So um, just, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but to make, it gets a little bit more complicated. What's actually happening, we've found since then, is that our initial idea that the RNA would be chopped up and come out is not entirely correct. Um, what we believe now is happening is that the high pH conditions, this capsid actually opens up and the RNA escapes through. And the way we know that is we have very large RNA molecules that we can see by SEC uh, as we analyze this, this uh, behavior. And so um, I just want to mention that that's a very important thing in the frontier of self-assembling proteins, is to start to understand how to cause them to go back into dynamic equilibrium and then back into an assembled shape. Okay, so we're studying that very carefully. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot that, they're, uh, that the system is trying to tell us. Nonetheless, with these empty capsules in hand, um, we turn to the exterior functionalization of this. And, um, this was actually uh, fairly straightforward to do. We have a number of ways to modify the exterior surface of this capsid using traditional bioconjugation approaches. Um, so I'll focus on these cysteine residues here, cysteine 101 and cysteine 46. Each monomer has two cysteines that face the exterior surface of the capsid. This is a cross section here. And so those are highlighted in yellow and in red up on this capsid above. Okay, and we can modify those cysteines. are among the easiest amino acids to modify. Um, for instance, one interesting way we can do this is treat this with these disulfides. These disulfides do an exchange where this sulfur binds to here, and you have your new chemical function group attached to the capsid. Um, we, the way we analyze these things, the way we know that we modified the protein, um, I'll, I'll just point out that gels are generally not that useful for us because the molecular weight changes associated with these molecules are far too small. 
Okay, so you won't see a shift in the gel bands. So we do almost everything by mass spectrometry. And so um, we have access to electrospray and MALDI and MSMS uh, instruments in our department. And what we do is we tear this capsule apart and look at the MALDI MS spectra of the individual components. Okay, and you can see here is the wild type that remains, and here is our singly modified coat protein. And so we can adjust these conditions to get all of the red dots. Um, we can change these conditions and get the red dots and the yellow dots, which would be 360 modifications per capsid and so on, just by changing the conditions under which we run this. Um, as a second approach to this, and we can also modify lysine residues, again, the, probably the most commonly used bioconjugation reaction is to take NHS esters, such as this compound, and hit the lysines, which you see in red on the exterior surface of the capsid. So each monomer gets hit three times on average using this chemistry, uh, predominantly on the exterior surface where the red dots are. So the reason we've chosen our specific functional groups is to introduce new chemical handles to put our polymers onto the capsid. And so this introduces this ketone functional group right here. And ketones are a functional group that proteins do not possess. None of the 20 amino acids have ketones. And so as a chemist, I can come up with reactions that are specific to ketones. And many people have done this in the literature. Um, th so I can do a secondary bioconjugation reaction right on these sites. And we can do that, in fact, with polymers. Um, for example, we take these polyethylene glycol polymers that have molecular rates from 1,000 to 5,000. And we, create, we turn these into alkoxyamines, and this will react with the ketone to form this stable chemical linkage. This is called an oxime. And that's a very nice way to link that to the capsid shell. Now, this is not the prettiest gel in the world. Um, peg compounds are actually very difficult to visualize on gels. They don't stay well with silver or kumasi. Um, but we'll do the best we can. Um, this is our unmodified MS2 monomer after tearing it apart. And we can see in the gel now the presence of these higher bands in the gel, which are retained more. Those are the polymer conjugates of the protein. Okay? And so you can kind of estimate that, say, 35% or so of the proteins were unmodified. 35% of the monomers are, are actually probably about 60% are modified one time, and you have a little bit up here that's modified more than that. If we up the conditions, if we use a large excess of PEG, we can actually take this to completion. So every single coat protein monomer is at least modified, uh, in this case, two times and predominantly even three times. Okay? So what this allows us to do is to put different amounts of polyethylene glycol on the outside of the capsid. And so um, with our capsids, we can have 270,000, we estimate right here. That's the weight of the polymer attached to the capsid shell. Or in this case, we get close to a million in molecular weight for the polymer attached to the outer shell, and so on. And so we can tune not only the length of the polymers, but also the amount of the polymers and the type of the polymers using this. And so um, concurrent with these studies, we are now doing light scattering experiments. We do know that these uh, capsids remain assembled throughout this process. So these are still assembled, even though they have one million molecular weight of uh, PEG on the outside of them. Um, we're now doing light scattering uh, experiments to see how does the hydrodynamic radii of the capsid change when you put this much polymer on there. Is it extended polymer? Is it packed in? Or what happens to these things? Um, these are going to be key things to uh, put up against the pharmacokinetic behavior of these capsids. And so as we start to do in vivo experiments to see how these are trafficked, what the circulation half-lives are, and how they resist antibody resistance, these are parameters we're going to try to correlate with that. Okay. Um, but what was a little bit uh, more challenging and, and from the point of view of chemistry a little more interesting is how do we modify the inside of this capsid? Um, this capsid, uh, we sort of ran the gamut of the traditional bioconjugation reactions. Most of them target cysteines and lysines. Those are up here. Um, and so we need some new chemical functional handle on this virus to put our drug molecules inside. And this is my lab specialty. Okay, we try to come up with these new reactions that can be used for this purpose. Um, my favorite amino acid, if you talk to me very long, you'll find out is tyrosine. Uh, tyrosines line the inner surface of this capsid. Each monomer has four tyrosines in the sequence, but only one of them is exposed on the surface, and it's on the inside. That's in green. Okay? So if we could come up with a tyrosine-specific reaction, then we have the ability to put 180 new functional groups inside this viral capsid. And in fact, um, we tried a lot of them, but our favorite is the diazonium coupling reaction. Okay? So a little complicated, but basically what you do, you take simple anilines, you buy these. They're commercially available. And in a procedure that takes in total about an hour, but only 15 minutes of protein modification, um, the tyrosines react with these diazonium salts to form this group right here. That's called an azo group. Azo groups are dyes. Um, if you eat like FDNC yellow number five or anything red or orange that you eat has azo compounds in it. Okay? Um, so this is a very stable linkage here, and this allows us to functionalize the tyrosines. It's very specific for tyrosines. It doesn't react with any of the other uh, amino acids. And we can follow this several ways. Um, first, we can do our MALDI mass spec. This is the uh, unmodified capsid monomer here at 13730. And you can see over the course of 15 minutes, we have complete conversion to 13878. It doesn't show up very well. But this is the mass that corresponds to the singly modified capsid protein. So we have virtually 100% coupling using this reaction. Um, you can also see that absorption come in in the UV spectrum because, again, they are orange. So how do we know we hit the right tyrosine? Um, in all the cases I'll talk about today, what we do is we then take the protein 
and we uh, expose this protein to trypsin. Now, we know from the previous slide that our protein gained 149 mass units upon being modified. And what we do is use trypsin to cleave this with all the arginine and lysine residues, and then look at the mass of the individual peptide fragments. One of them will weigh 149 too much. Um, this is a pretty standard thing to do in biology. And um, we found that it is, in fact, this fragment here, this yellow fragment, um, has this red tyrosine on it. This is tyrosine 85, which was the one we, in fact, targeted. Okay? And we see none of the other tyrosines being modified uh, through this reaction. So we're in a position with this uh, sort of good news and bad news. The good news is that we had a reaction that was completely selective for one residue on the capsid, and it goes to completion. We can hit all the monomers, and the whole thing stays assembled after we do it. The bad news is that this reaction is specific for having a nitro group right here in the para position. You have to have that group. And um, that's not an easy group to derivatize in terms of organic chemistry. Okay, there are ways to do it, but they're too harsh for proteins. They wouldn't withstand that. And so what we needed was a way around this. We needed to continue our sequence here to come up with a way to attach the drug molecules to this site. Um, so to do that, my graduate student uh, came up with, uh, I think, a pretty cool route to do this. What we do is we take our functionalized viral capsid monomers and we treat them with sodium diphionite, which is a reducing agent. And what that does is it reduces this nitrogen-nitrogen double bond. It splits it in half and leaves an amine group behind. Okay, and so what we did... So we just cleaved all this stuff off, and now we have an amino tyrosine, which again is an unnatural amino acid. Okay? And so this is still a unique functional handle. Um, well, then we can subject that with oxidants. Um, if you add pyridate, our particular favorite, um, this amino tyrosine will be oxidized to this species, and this is an uh, aminoquinone. Okay, don't worry too much about the terminology. What you should know about this is that this is a very reactive species. It's very, you, there are very few examples of people using these in the literature. Because they're so reactive, they make a mess. Okay, they, they react with each other, they dimerize, and so on. But ours are site isolated all over the inside of this capsid, and so we can actually have this as a stable species in solution for a reasonable period of time. Okay, so now we have all kinds of functionalization reactions we can do on this aminoquinone. Um, the one that we've been the most successful with is to treat these with these acylated phenylene diamine compounds. These also get oxidized, and these two components react to form these structures. That's called a heterodiels alder reaction. Um, the advantage of this strategy is that this is incredibly efficient, it's incredibly fast, and it's orthogonal to all the other amino acids on the protein surface. Um, if you do not have this amino group here, none of the amino acids on proteins react with this species during this process. Okay, so we have a new chemo-specific reaction. And now we can attach things to what used to be our tyrosine moiety, and the, the final product, it re-aromatizes to form this benzoxazine. Okay? Um, so we can follow this again by Maldi. Um, after five minutes, we go from this. This is the mass of the amino compound. Five minutes later, you have this conversion to 13,898. Um, that is the residual starting material right there. So again, it's a, it's a very clean reaction. So what can we do with this? Um, we looked at the substrate scope. We can have a variety of these components that will couple in this reaction. I'll kind of skip over that. Um, this is our favorite, this acylated phenylene diamine right here. Um, you can imagine replacing this acyl group with all kinds of different functionality. And we've been able to do that. Um, first, we put on these rhodamine compounds. Um, these are large dye molecules that we can get inside the capsid and couple on the inside. We still get very high yield. We don't have a number for this one because the mass spec of these are fairly challenging to get, but it's at least 75% conversion. We get excellent conversion, 95% for these fluorescent coumarin analogs, and currently we are now working on Taxol itself. Uh, we've been able to take Taxol. We have modified the 2 prime hydroxy group with this diacid linker. That's standard chemistry somebody else worked out. And then we couple this to our phenylene diamine, and we're now coupling that into the capsid this week. So we hope that this will give us our route to putting the molecules on the inside. Um, the last thing that I'll mention just in passing is um, we have devised an acid labile strategy too. This red doesn't show up very well in here. Um, but basically we have designed this new linker that we've shown in my lab. is stable at pH 7.5 but is labile uh, at about pH 5.5. Okay? So that is our acid release system that we have. There are others in the literature that you could choose. Um, but these furyl acetals I think have a pretty good promise for this. Um, here we're using the methoxy derivative, and so what we want to do, we haven't done this yet, is couple this to the amino M MS2 to put this inside the capsid. After this is exposed to acid, that is the bond that breaks, which releases native taxol itself. Okay, so that's, that's our strategy, and that's what we'll be working on in the next few months on that end. Um, there are several viruses we work with in my group. We actually work with four different ones, and I'll talk about one more in the, the remaining time here, and that's the tobacco mosaic virus. And, um, this is a classic, probably all of you have heard of the tobacco mosaic virus somewhere. Um, two Nobel Prizes at least have been given for work associated with this virus. It's in all the biochemistry books. What we're fascinated with by this structure is it's a very different shape than MS2. MS2 makes round materials. This makes these long 300 nanometer rod-like materials. And what we thought was interesting was um, what this comprises is a 6400 nucleotide single-stranded RNA genome, and it's encapsulated by protein monomers that assemble in this spiral 
all the way down here. And it's actually 2,100 identical copies of the protein monomer that form the full uh, 300 nanometer rod. Now this has some of the same properties of MS2 in that it also presents two surfaces for modification. Um, this capsid is hollow, and if you look really carefully in this TEM, you can see this black line going down the center of the capsid. That's the staining agent going down the center. Um, there's a four nanometer channel across the outside. The exterior is 18 nanometers across. Okay, so again, we think these could be very interesting for tube-like materials, maybe new types of conductive materials, and, and so on. And I'll show you how we uh, envision building those types of things. But certainly one of the things that my lab enjoys about this is that this is a very practical virus. Um, we get one to two grams of virus per about 30 tobacco plants that we infect with it. So you disinfect the tobacco plants, you spend the day in a cold room with a blender, and you get gram quantities, which is ludicrous for, for working with proteins. Um, we've done calculations based on the USDA statistics that one acre of tobacco should make 100 kilograms of tobacco mosaic virus, should someone let you inoculate it. So um, <laughs> they need to diversify, right? Okay, so. Uh, Again, our strategy is to come up with the chemistry to modify the exterior surface and the interior surface of each monomer to make a core shell material. And so um, we've been able to do that. Um, that. Uh, what we do is we target amino acid residues. Um, here's a tyrosine, this yellow tyrosine 139. Um, in different views of the virus, this tyrosine is displayed around the exterior surface of this ring. And so you can see in this rendered version of it, this gives us sites all over the outside, 2,100 of them, spaced 3.3 nanometers apart. Okay. Um, we can then target GLU-97 and GLU-106 with orthogonal chemistry, and this chemistry hits these red and blue things on the inside of the, the circle, and this gives us the inside of the tube uh, through orthogonal coupling chemistry. So I'll skip through this pretty fast because um, I want to just sort of show you what we're going to do with it. But again, we use diazonium chemistry to modify the exterior surface. This goes extremely well. We have a ketone introduced with this, and as before, we can react that with alkoxymines, just like we did in the case of MS2. And so um, this is a way we can attach our sorts of molecules. Here's an example with biotin on there. What you see is that none of the wild type remains and none of the ketone remains. Both reactions, so far as we can tell, go to completion. Uh, we can tell that by mass spec and by UV analysis of the, the chromophore. Um, so this gives us a way to hit the outside. Uh, we can also hit the inside using carbidiamide chemistry. Um, basically, this is a way to make amide bonds. We can treat these with amines, and this reacts with glue and, uh, glutamic acid residues to form amide bonds, such as this one. And we can use this to put a wide variety of functionality on the inside. Okay, and I won't go through what we want to do with every single one of these, but one of the things um, that I do want to point out is that it's very exciting to bind metal ions to the insides of these capsids for all sorts of reasons. Um, one is that if you can put metal ions in there, you might be able to think about putting catalytic functional sites in there. And so, for instance, rhodium, one of the big catalytic metals, we can bind rhodium to the inside of this capsid by first putting these imidazoles, this histidine-type side chain, all down the inside of the capsid. TMB doesn't have any imidazoles, any histidines. And so now we can have rhodium complexes all down here, and we've been able to quantify by AA that we, in fact, can do that. Um, we don't know if they're catalytic yet or not. Uh, a second one is this. This very simple uh, amino peg compound um, gives you a silver ion chelator. And that would be interesting, too, because you can put silver ions all down the inside of this tube. You can then add more silver in solution hydroquinone, and that causes it to reduce to silver zero. It's like you do in a silver gel, the way you stain a silver gel. And so this would be a way to template the growth of metal wires down the inside of this. And that's actually been done using viral capsids by other groups. The advantage we think we have is that we can tune this to bind all sorts of metals in here, in particular cobalt, uh, and get cobalt wires down the inside of this. Um, I'm working with a, one of my colleagues, Jeff Long at Berkeley, who's interested in studying the magnetic properties of metallic cobalt that is built within the inside of this viral capsid. Um, in terms of where we're going to go with the outside modifications, there's a couple things. Um, one of them is that I think would be very exciting is to take advantage of the fact that TMV positions it, these sites with a great deal of regularity. Um, again, one of the challenges in nanoscience is we can build nanoscale objects, but how do you position them in the right places so that they can function together? And I think one of the most exciting things to look at in nature in this regard are light harvesting systems in photosynthetic bacteria. This is just, I, I have this hobby of photophysics. Um, what these things are, if you're not familiar with them, these are sort of life preserver type structures that are in the membranes of photosynthetic bacteria. And these serve as the primary collectors of photons to drive photosynthesis. And what happens is these blue chromophores, these are bacteria chlorophylls positioned around the outside of this assembly, absorb photons of light and then transfer that energy like a wire from chromophore to chromophore through fluorescence resonance energy transfer, FRET. Okay? Um, it doesn't stop there. You have another ring and another ring and another ring. And so they travel through these like wires. And finally, they end up in a different light harvesting complex that contains a special pair of chromophores that carries out photosynthesis. Okay? And so this serves as a big collection antenna. It absorbs many, many more photons. You have many chromophores, each of which can absorb photons. You also get a wider spectral range 
of light that you can collect and shove it into one reactive site. And so people have tried to mimic these things with a variety of systems. And one of the most successful is actually my, my postdoctoral advisor, Jean Frechet, who does these with dendermers, these round spherical polymers that he tries to use. And there's just some amazing systems that have been worked out that way. But the types of systems we would like to work with are ones where it requires the rigid positioning of these chromophores. The, the trick here, these chromophores for this to work have to be within five nanometers of each other for the energy transfer. But yet they can't collide. Because if one chromophore gets excited by a photon and collides with another one, they both drop down to the ground state. You dissipate the energy. Okay? And nature, as always, solves this beautifully by shoving alpha helices in between there as insulators. And so you can see what the design is here. It's to keep these things slight isolated, but close enough that they can communicate with each other. And that's been very difficult to make with synthetic systems because they lack the rigidity. And so a big focus in my lab is to do this with the T and V structures. Um, I skipped the slide, but T and V can actually be torn apart and put back together into a variety of shapes. And that's a unique thing in terms of biomolecules. Um, you can imagine that we can put these chromophores on each of the individual monomers, and we could assemble these into rings or into tubes. Both of these types of structures are known, and both of which we've been able to make in my lab. And the idea is that these are now positioned 3.3 nanometers apart all around the periphery of these rings. And you can see that these have some similarity to these structures at the top. These are bigger, but the chromophore distance between here and here and here and here is the same. Okay, so we think these would be very good mimics uh, in terms of, of developing these light harvesting systems. Okay, so that's one of the things that we're working on. And then finally, the um, last thing I'll mention is, um, so biomolecules, uh, whenever I go to companies and talk to real engineers about this, about what they'd like to do, um, they're horrified by the conditions of biomolecules. The, the water, they hate water. They don't like the temperature limitations. They don't like all these different things. One of the things that we might be able to do with our reactions is to pretty much drastically change the way that these, pro these uh, proteins behave. And the one that we're particularly interested in is organic solvent tolerance. Um, you know, we as organic chemists also hate water. Uh, it's not pretty to watch organic chemists work in aqueous solutions. So we would like to be able to take proteins into organic solvents, and we have a much wider range of flexibility for our chemical reactions. And so here's an example. Those ketones on the exterior surface of TMV, we've been able to modify with these 16 carbon chains that, again, end in our alkoxy means. You see, we like that reaction. Um, this puts these hydrophobic chains all over the exterior surface of the capsid like this. Okay, this actually does not have the little red parts at the end. And then um, what we now have is a virus, after doing this, that dissolves in ether, diethyl ether. And so as you all know, the proteins don't dissolve in ether. They only dissolve in aqueous solution. And so and we also know that the thing stays assembled once it's in there. Okay, so now we have a very different uh, surface property all around the ex exterior surface of this. And what we like to do is take advantage of this to order these into larger assemblies. Um, one of the neat things that we can now do, we have a protein assembly that is not soluble in water. And so we can think about taking advantage of a very common and very old ordering technique called the langmuir blodgett technique. Okay, and what that is, is you have hydrophobic molecules at the interface between water, an aqueous solution, and air. Okay, and then you have this special trough and you increase the surface tension on the top of the water. And what that does is it causes these molecules to order into a monolayer. Okay? And this only works, again, if these are hydrophobic molecules that don't dissolve in water. So now we believe that our viruses will form these highly ordered arrays and films on the surface of the water. And so we're exploring that again this summer. Um, we have the hydrophobic particles, and we're going to see if we can order these into vertical arrays or horizontal arrays. And um, I'm pretty excited to see what kinds of things that we can do. If we can do that, that starts to get us toward forming membranes where, again, we have the ability to tune what's inside each of these rods in terms of conductance properties, in terms of catalytic properties, and transport properties. And then we have this sort of two-dimensional array of these things, and you can control what goes through. So that's another application that we're, we're focusing on. So um, just in terms of, of finishing up, the other thing that we've been able to do now, um, obviously these are just uh, molecules that are free in solution. We want to eventually think about hooking these up to electrodes. And that's another key problem I mentioned with actin um, that we have to address in nanoscience. How do we develop ways to connect all these great assemblies we can make into device structures. And so one of the things about TMV is we can add additional modification reactions to modify the ends of the virus. Um, the ends of the virus here and here are not symmetrical. They are different. And so um, we've targeted lysines. There are two lysines on each capsid monomer. And fortunately for us, they both face down. Okay? So there are lysines sandwiched in between each of these arrays of monomers. But when we treat these with NHS esters, those lysines do not get modified. We can show that very clearly by Western analysis. But the ones at the bottom, this bottom ring of 17 protein monomers on the capsid does get modified. Okay, we can see those are, are connected. And so we can turn these into different functional groups now and hit one end of the capsid. So we have the outside, the inside, and the bottom. And now is where 
um, we wanted to hit the last surface, the fourth surface of the TMV rod. And uh, we sort of were out of options because there are no good amino acids on the top surface of the virus that we would be able to modify. And now is when we bring in site-directed mutagenesis. And so what we did is we cloned the protein gene, the coat protein gene. Uh, we made a mutant. We changed a serine residue to a cysteine residue, cysteine-123, that we've introduced. Our recombinant TMV now assembles into rods and into discs, just like the wild type. But now we can hit these cysteine residues that are on the top. We can, this is just a malamid reaction to hit cysteines. There are any number of reactions that we can use for that. Okay? Uh, to be fair, what we do not yet know, there are still cysteines in between, sandwiched in between each of these stacks of monomers. We do not know that they do not participate in the reaction yet. Okay? Um, but if we're thinking about attaching these to electrodes, um, those cysteines can't be attached to electrodes anyway. Only the ones on the ends can. So we'll see how selective this functionalization is. But the point is, we can now access all four surfaces on these, on these rings. Okay? Um, so I'm out of time. Uh, what I just want to mention is what drives all of this are new chemical reactions. And this is the main focus that my group does. So it's actually kind of unusual not to talk about these. Um, so these are six new reactions. I talked about this one here today. Um, these are six new reactions that we have coming out. And this is more advertisement than anything else. If you guys have, say, tryptophans or disulfide bonds uh, or, or you want to functionalize in termini of proteins, I'd be glad to talk to you about the types of things that we can do and discuss some applications through collaborations. Um, so, Because this is the main thing that, that most of my lab does. Finally, most important slide, I, I have an incredibly talented uh, group of students um, that, if nothing else, show a total lack of judgment for joining a brand new research group uh, when I certainly don't know what I'm doing. Um, these are great kids. I owe them a lot. Um, the people whose work I discussed primarily today, um, Ernest Kovacs and Jacob Hooker, that's the team that developed all the MS2 chemistry on the spherical viruses. Uh, Tara Schlick, Andrew Presley, Jay Boding uh, have developed most of the chemistry up to this point for TMV, and they've been joined by Patrick Holder and Chris Tom now for some of the new applications. Um, all of them, though, have contributed incredibly, and I'd like to thank these groups for funding and Drew for the invitation and all of you for your attention. Thanks. We're opening the floor for questions. <clears throat> Sending the microphone. I want to ask about your film of TMV. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 30 times as thick as a standard membrane. Is that yes. going to be an obstacle, or? Well, so one of the things that we need to find out is um, we're we're just starting to ask these questions now. Is we, there are two ways that that film could be oriented? One is it could lay down like logs in a river, right? Uh, where they're horizontal, and that would lead to some interesting applications. But what we really want to do is somehow pull them up to get 300 nanometer film thickness. There are some applications. Um, one of the things we want to do is put acrylamides at the end that we can cross-link after forming the film. And that would give us a stable membrane that would then not disassemble after removing it. And for that application, you want it to be thicker. So I think 300 nanometers would be good for that. Um, we, again, we don't know if we can get them to stand up in this orientation or not. You can put a lot of pressure on these trays, and we can now think about putting little hydrophilic tails that would stick down in the water and kind of like a buoy, you know. Um, but, <laughs> for lack of a better term, uh, but I, there is some trick that we can play. Um, so one of the things I didn't mention is why are these things 300 nanometers long? Um, it turns out that, uh, just like MS2, the assembly of the viral capsid is initiated by a stem loop of RNA, a 19 nucleotide stem loop. And so that stem loop forms the first aggregation of disks, which do a phase transition into this lock washer. And that then propagates the assembly down the rest of the helix. Is that, it's a beautiful system uh, once it's figured out. And it's been shown that you know, it just runs out of RNA, and so it stops assembling at the end. That's why the 300 nanometers, that's the length of the genome. So you can take that RNA stem loop and truncate it and get different lengths of rods. That's been done in the literature, but not by us. And so you can imagine if 300 nanometers is too thick for an application, you could make them shorter. If you're thinking six, like a natural cell membrane, it turns out the double disc, I, well, I didn't show you this, but um, if you put TMV under the right salt and pH conditions, it forms 17-fold uh, symmetrical double discs, which are 6 nanometers thick. So if you want to form a thin membrane more close to a cell membrane, you can, in fact, do that, perhaps. So. Another question there. Do your viruses actually enter cells? Um, have you checked that? They, on their own, they do not. Uh, they, well, they have their own cells that they infect. MS2 infects E. coli, HFR positive E. coli, and, and TMV affects tobacco and a variety of other plants. They do not, so far as we know, have any active uptake mechanism for mammalian cells. And so that's why we need to add it, say, for drug delivery, um, where we need to add folic acid um, so it gets recognized by receptors on the surface. But um, it's going to be really interesting to, to study this because um, one of the things that people have shown is if you put enough PEG on certain things, it'll cause sort of a type of vesicle fusion with the cell membrane. So perhaps already that will give them a way to enter into the inside of the cells. We simply don't know. 
So we can put dye molecules in there and maybe ask some of those questions uh, through, through uh, in vitro assays. Yeah. We have one here and then there. I was trying to follow the stoichiometry of drug delivery. I mean, in a normal virus, you'd have replication to help you out in the process of infecting further cells. And I was trying to see how you could get enough drug molecules into enough cells uh, with this delivery system. So how many capsules would you need to deliver a therapeutic dose? Yeah, and, and what percentage of the cells would you have to hit at what multiplicity of infection, as it were? <laughs> yeah, so, so we don't, um, okay, so it's not really an MOI, but I, I know what you mean. Um, we haven't done the calculation of exactly how many taxol molecules you would need to deliver, okay? I think we're best off doing that somewhat empirically. Um, but one thing that I think is more important, a more important question to ask is how much less are you going to need than the actual, ther the current therapeutic dose for taxol? Because what you have is a focusing effect. And so instead of being distributed throughout the patient, it's focused theor theoretically on the tumor tissue itself. And so that will cause a big change. I think those factors are going to far outweigh what we can calculate how many viruses we actually need to get in. We could certainly do that and we haven't done it. The, the problem is that the way Taxol works, it, it's a, it's a, uh, it has nanomolar affinity for tubulin, the ends of microtubules, and prevents depolymerization. You probably know, know that. Um, but the problem is that uh, that's a concentration we have to achieve. So it's not exactly an absolute number of molecules. So there's a time component. How many get in? How fast is it released? What concentration builds up in a cell before they're kicked back out by pumps and so on? So that's an extremely difficult question to answer. Um, so I'm sorry I don't have a better one for you. We, could, we should do a calculation and see just how many capsules we need uh, for that. We're just done there. So uh, we've heard several times during the meeting about uh, unnatural amino acids. Mm -hmm. uh, as an organic chemist, what are the, what are the ones that, uh, that are most attractive to go after and uh, would be most useful from the standpoint of a synthetic uh, chemist? Yeah. So we can't wait. Uh, they're part of the strategy for building up my group. So the, there are two basic techniques that have come out for introducing artificial amino acids. Um, one arguably more flexible than the other one, but they'll remain nameless. Um, and these techniques are still somewhat difficult to accomplish if you're in a brand new lab like my own. Okay, so those are best done through collaboration. So certainly we keep our eye on that. And what we're trying to learn is how does one approach reaction development in the context of, of biomolecules? Uh, to just take a step back, there's, there's a big philosophical problem with organic chemistry, uh, at least one, um, which is that we, when we approach a new reaction, what we do is we change all the conditions of that reaction, the concentration, solvent, temperature, pressure, to get that reaction to do what we want. Okay? And the fundamental problem with biology, um, addressing biomolecules, is they don't you know, withstand that. You have to do it under their conditions and their parameters. And so that's something we're not so good at. So what I'm hoping to do is learn the rules for that. What can you get away with and not get away with in anticipation that those techniques are going to continue to improve in their, in their generality. I mean, they are general, but, but the sort of ease with which you can just you know, dive in and do it. But definitely we want some of those function groups. Um, Pete Schultz has already put uh, a catechol group on proteins, which is a, a tyrosine with one extra oxygen. Um, there's a possibility that that could be oxidized to the orthoquinone and participate in our heterodeals-alto reaction already. Um, certainly down in Scripps, they have this, this quick reaction, which is a ZIDs plus alkynes. We've done that in my lab as well. Um, that's another one you, if you put a ZIDs on proteins. I think there's all kinds of, there's a big future for the introduction of new, uh, you know, components for reactions. The other thing that I'll say, though, is um, it's going to be, you're going to need both approaches because um, no matter how, no matter how many function groups you can put on the protein, you're always going to want a secondary bioconjugation reaction for a lot of other, you know, applications. And so I think the future for doing these types of things on those amino acids is, is pretty bright. We'll take just one last question. Um, you mentioned that your drug delivery capsid gets taken up into the cell through the endocytic route, and because the endocytic compartments are um, have low pH, the capsid gets um, degraded. And how how do you think the drug is going to get out of the endocytic compartments and into the places of the cells that where they can function? Yeah. So it depends on the drug. Um, so specifically, we don't know that the capsid will be degraded. Um, the MS2 will survive uh, pH is much lower than you find in lysosomes, so we're not sure. It may need to be proteolized or whatever, but the, what does break is the linkage that we use to attach the taxol, so it should diffuse out. Um, taxol already has the ability to move into cells and cross membranes. It's lipophilic, um, and so we would anticipate if you can release it, just disconnect it from the capsid, um, it'll have its normal activity as if it had just crossed the outer cell membrane to begin with. But where I think that's a really important question to think about is for gene delivery. If you want to think about antisense nucleotides or perhaps you know, a double-stranded RNA or something like that, that's a much larger problem because those are charged, nucleotides are charged and cannot cross membranes. And so um, we are not actively pursuing this, but you could think about co-packaging um, some things that can cause you know, membrane, uh, transmembrane activity for these, like, like polylysine or something with, 
with those uh, nucleotides inside. Um, so that's where you would need to address that question a little bit more. But for the drug molecules, I, I don't think we'll have to. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Our next speaker is uh, Jake Hiesling from UC Berkeley on uh, retooling bacteria for drug production. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to motivate my talk by uh, describing a particular problem uh, that we're trying to address. And that is malaria. It's caused by the plasmodium, uh, which is a single cell protozoan that infects red blood cells and is transmitted by the Anopheles mosquito. Uh, there are about one and a half to two and a half million people every year that die of malaria, and 90% of them are children under the age of five. It affects most of these countries here in red, so about 40% of the world's population is at risk. And of those countries that suffer from malaria, it's been estimated by economists that it reduces their GDP by 50%. So it is debilitating for those who survive the disease. The most widely used drugs are the chloroquine-based drugs. They're used widely because they're cheap, but they're ineffective. The plasmodium has grown largely resistant to these types of drugs. There is a miracle drug. It's called artemisinin. It was actually discovered by the Chinese in 350 BC and was used to treat hemorrhoids. And in about 150 AD in the Chinese literature, you see that they were using teas of Artemisia annua, the plant that makes artemisinin, to treat fevers, malaria, namely. Now, this plant grows all over the world, but the plants that produce large quantities of artemisinin grow in the hills of Southeast Asia. And they obtain artemisinin and supply it to companies like GSK and Novartis by extracting the plant with diesel fuel. So the product is contaminated, and the uh, amounts that they can get are variable depending on the climates. Now, artemisinin falls in a large family of natural products called terpenoids. In fact, there are 50,000 catalog terpenoids that include essential oils like flavors and fragrances. Most of your perfumes and colognes contain terpenes as the active uh, fragrance. They also include carotenoids, which are great UV protective agents and turn tomatoes red and carrots orange. There are also a number of chemotherapeutics, one of which we just heard about, Taxol, which was extracted and discovered in the bark of the Pacific U, but is now found in the needles of a related plant and is derivatized. And then there are the chemotherapeutics like eleutherobin, which survived through phase two clinical trials, but then was discarded because they couldn't obtain enough of the material to go further through clinical trials. Now, these molecules are produced from isopentanyl pyrophosphate, or IPP, a C5 precursor that's produced in every organism. And this is then condensed with dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate to form the C10 geranyl pyrophosphate, the C15 farnesyl pyrophosphate, and the C20 geranyl geranyl pyrophosphate. And then these are cyclized to form the mono, sesqui, and diterp diterpenes, or two GPPs are condensed to form the carotenoids. Now, the incredible diversity of this family of molecules comes from the terpene cyclases that take these precursors and form these cyclized aliphatics, or cyclized aromatics. Um, these compounds, uh, some of these enzymes, in fact, will take a single FPP or GPP and make up to 50 different products. So there's incredible plasticity and flexibility in these enzymes. And if we could capture that, we could capture this enormous family of molecules. Now, the molecule I'm going to be talking about is artemisinin, and it's produced from amorphodine, which is produced from farnesyl pyrophosphate the C15 precursor. Now, uh, there are two ways you can get the precursors for the terpenes. One is through the non-levalinate or DXP pathway. This pathway was actually just recently elucidated, uh, and the genes cloned from E. coli. Now, it's called the non-levalinate pathway to contrast with the mevalinate pathway, which is very well known because it's found in you and me, and it's responsible for cholesterol biosynthesis. And most of our drugs actually target an enzyme in this pathway. So we know a lot about this pathway, less about the non-levalinate pathway. The non-levalinate pathway exists in bacteria and in the chloroplasts of most photosynthetic organisms. The mevalinate pathway exists in yeast and in eukaryotes like you and me. 
Okay, so what's the problem with artemisinin? It's a great drug, but it's too expensive. It adds about a dollar to the cost, a dollar to a dollar fifty to the cost of drugs, which means that those drugs are, pardon me? So uh, that's a great question. Uh, the best negotiated price that the World Health Organization has negotiated with Novartis is $2.40 for a dose. A dose is a cure, okay? But um, the problem is that most countries spend less than $4 per year per person on health care. And what's more is there's so many mosquitoes that you need about 10 to 12 treatments a year uh, to treat everyone. Now, if you read the New York Times uh, a month ago, there was an article on the front page uh, put out by the World Health Organization, and there's going to be an enormous shortage of this molecule. In fact, uh, we're going to need about 700 tons annually just to treat the people who, who can, you know, get the pills. So our approach is to produce this molecule in E. coli. And we hope that in doing so, we can reduce the cost of this drug by an order of magnitude. And I'm going to talk to you about that today. Now, the advantages are, you know, we know how to scale up microbial fermentations. We can start with inexpensive starting materials like glucose or high fructose corn syrup. We can, we don't have to worry about the weather. We can produce this in bioreactors and we can make relatively pure product that's not contaminated by other terpenes, which will reduce the cost because it reduces the purification. The challenge is that we need all the enzymes and the genetic pathways. It's not always simple to take those genes from a plant and express them in something like E. coli. We need to balance the metabolic pathways because any wastage of materials increases the cost of the drug. And we need a platform host that will allow us to easily engineer these metabolic pathways. Now, uh, as I said, we're going to first identify those enzymes. We're going to clone the genes, place them into E. coli. We're going to supply intracellular precursors at very high levels. And to do that, we need a well-characterized genetic control system, so good genetic parts, which we've heard a lot about the past two days. And I'm going to talk about each one of these because we've been working on genetic parts for some time in my lab. And I first want to talk about expression vectors. If you go to Genentech and you talk to them about using expression vectors to produce pharmaceutical proteins, they will probably have used high copy plasmids, which produce a lot of the protein of interest. But in our case, the protein is catalytic. It's not our final product. So we want to produce just catalytic amounts. So single copy ought to be high enough for catalytic amounts of our enzyme of interest. And I'm going to show you an example where this is the case. So I've got the DXP pathway up here abbreviated. This is the pathway that exists naturally in E. coli. And I've placed into E. coli on a, another plasmid uh, the genes to produce a carotenoid, in this case, lycopene. And we placed on a separate high copy plasmid and the DXS gene, which is the gene for the first enzyme in this DXP pathway. We've placed this under the control of an inducible promoter, and we're going to titrate inducer in. And in fact, we get the opposite effect that we want. What we'd really like to see is that as, as we titrate inducer in, we get more of our final product. But in fact, as we titrate inducer in, we get less of our final product. Part of that may be the copy number of uh, the gene in the cell. So many years ago, we decided that uh, the better strategy would be to use the chromosome or to get a good surrogate for the chromosome, a bacterial artificial chromosome. And the bacterial artificial chromosome that we constructed was from the F plasmid. It's very similar to those that are out there, uh, except that we have two origins of replication in our F plasmid. And luckily for us, the business end was on a 9 KB eco R1 fragment of that large plasmid. Just briefly, you saw today about how the F plasmid could take mRNA and tether it out to the uh, boundaries of the cell. Well, the way that works is a partition element that encodes proteins that actually tether the plasmid on the membrane of the cell. And this ensures that each cell gets a plasmid at cell division. The other aspect of that is that you have to have two plasmids before the cells can divide. And so those origins of replication that I talked about actually time the replication exactly in the middle of the cell cycle so that you have two plasmids prior to their partitioning into daughter cells at division. And finally, in case all else fails, uh, there is a cell killing mechanism that kills cells that arise without the plasmid. So all in all, it ends up being a very stable plasmid, and that's shown here. In the absence of any selection pressure, 100% of the cells maintain the plasmid 
even up to, in this case, 150 generations or 300 hours. This is a two-hour doubling time. And this, again, is with or without gene expression and no selection pressure. And we contrast that to a high copy puck plasmid that's lost in about 40 generations. So they're extremely stable. The other nice features of this plasmid are demonstrated here. In the absence of induction, we have very low expression. But when we induce expression, we get relatively high expression from these single copy vectors. And there's relatively little metabolic burden on the growth as determined by the growth rate of the host. Now, let's go back to our original experiment where we were taking this rate limiting step and coding it on now our bacterial artificial chromosome under the control of an inducible promoter and look at the final level of our carotenoids. And again, the idea is can we titrate in inducer and change the level of expression of this uh, rate limiting enzyme and produce more carotenoids. And in fact, we see that we have a very good system now for controlling the expression of the first enzyme in that pathway. We can dial in the level of final product that we want. Now, we've got a vector. Let's go to another uh, controllable element, another genetic part, and that is the promoter. Now, if I'm designing a promoter to turn on gene expression, I'd like something that will respond some way linearly to the amount of inducer I add. So as I add more and more inducer, I can predict what level of output I'm going to get from that promoter. And that will be, in turn, translated through a flux through our metabolic pathways, hopefully. And this is very important for us because as we're adding in new metabolic pathways to E. coli or to any other organism, we want to balance those pathways so that we don't get the accumulation of intermediates or have rate-limiting amounts of intermediates that will limit the, the amount of our final product. Now, we've used the arabinose-inducible P-BAD promoter a lot in our laboratory. Uh, this plasmid work, or this promoter works uh, through an ERA-C protein that actually binds arabinose after it's transported through a transporter into the cell. That then, in turn, turns on gene expression, and it actually unfolds the DNA and allows the PBAD promoter to be expressed, and that, in turn, can express and produce your protein of interest. Now, the other feature of this promoter that's so important for what I'm going to tell you is that ERA-C also controls the promoter that produces the transport protein. So as you add more and more inducer, you get more and more transporter produced, more and more transporter in the membrane, more and more inducer transported in. So you get this cascade response from no induction to very high induction. Now, if we just take a culture of cells and we look at fluorescence, so the gene of interest in this case is GFP, as a function of the amount of arabinose we add, we see that we have a pretty good range where we can predict what the output of that promoter is going to be. And so on the face of it, this looks like a great promoter. Now, there are two ways to arrive at this level of gene expression. One is that every cell in the culture could behave exactly the same. That is, as you add low amounts of inducer, all the cells would be induced to a very low level. When you add high amounts of inducer, all the cells would be induced to a very high level. And then if you look at these using uh, facts, what you see is that you've got a single population of cells, all of them behaving roughly the same, with a little noise here and there. Now, the opposite effect is that you could have an all or none system, where as you add inducer, more and more cells become fully induced. So at low levels of inducer, you have a few cells that are fully induced and most of the cells uninduced. And at high levels of inducer, you have a lot of cells induced and very few cells uninduced. And of course, this by facts would give you two populations of cells that would vary depending on the amount of inducer. Now, if we look at the original PBAD system, the native PBAD system that's been developed and actually that's commercially available, in the absence of inducer, we have a single population of cells. But as you add inducer, you have two subpopulations. So this is this all or none effect where the cells are either induced, induced or uninduced. And that population, those two population sizes change depending on the amount of inducer you add. And it's a stable effect. So in other words, uh, when you add um, middle amounts of inducer or medium amounts of inducer, you have two populations of cells that are maintained stably with time. Now, the problem for us is that if we're using this promoter to control a metabolic pathway, we'll have intermediates that will accumulate in some cells that have induced this to high levels of expression. And those cells that haven't induced the, uh, 
the promoter to uh, at all will have no expression and therefore will have no final product produced. Now there's an additional caveat here, and I'm going to tell you about this in a little bit, and that is that IPP and DMAP actually are toxic when they accumulate in E. coli, and so these cells wouldn't produce any of your final product because they would die, and these cells wouldn't produce any of your final product because they aren't induced. So you have double jeopardy. Now the way to solve this problem is to take out that inducible promoter in front of the transport system, put a constitutive promoter in there. And in fact, we did this. this then you maintain the uh, same amount of transporter in the membrane no matter what level of inducer you have, but now you can control uh, the PBAD promoter, which controls the expression of your gene of interest. And in fact, this is the data that shows that that's the case. In the absence of inducer, you have uninduced cells here shown in gray, and as you add inducer, you have a single population of cells maintained. But all of those cells um, have expression at roughly the same level. So we've got homogeneous induction in those cells. So in, in essence, we've taken uh, an on-off switch and made it into a rheostat. And this will give you now reproducible expression of, say, a metabolic pathway in your engineered host. Now, the final tool that we've been developing is a way to bring many genes into the cell. I'm going to tell you a story at the end where we've brought in on the order of 10 genes into E. coli to make our desired product, that is artemisinin. And to do that, we have to take genes from plants and from yeast and from E. coli, and we've got to balance the expression of those genes. Now, we can place a promoter in front of each one of those genes, but eventually we're going to have problems with titration of ERA C. Now, one feature that E. coli and most other microbes have used is to actually string the genes together in uh, an operon. That is, they'll take all of these genes, express them under the control of one promoter. But the way they balance the expression of those genes is by selectively stabilizing certain parts of the transcript that encodes some of the proteins or enzymes in the pathway and destabilizing other parts of the transcript to downregulate the production of other enzymes in that metabolic pathway. And this gives the cell a way to uh, balance the expression of these genes. One example of where this is used is in the ATP synthase, where you have different stoichiometries of proteins that make up the final ATPase complex, but you never see a cell that has more of one of the subunits and less of the other one. They produce the subunits in exactly what's needed, and they do so using this mRNA stability. Now, in order to use this, you first have to have a series of secondary structures that will stabilize the mRNA. And over the years, we've generated a number of secondary structures that will actually stabilize the mRNA about an order of magnitude. And some of these skyscraper structures were built upon other structures. Now, I'd like to be able to tell you that we can predict how to get this mRNA stability by the sequence. We can't. There is another component there, and it probably has to do with steric factors and with other RNases. But what I can tell you is that we can stabilize the mRNA about an order of magnitude, and this translates into an order of magnitude more protein being produced from those more stable mRNAs. Now, the other feature of this is that we have to have RNase E sites. RNase E is an RNase that specifically cleaves the mRNA and is, in fact, the first enzyme, really, RNase, uh, that leads to the breakdown of mRNA. It's a very important RNase in E. coli. In fact, E. coli can't grow without it. And a few years ago, we showed that we could, in fact, place an RNA site between two genes and control the expression or control the degradation of that mRNA. Now the key is, can we balance this metabolic pathway by expressing some genes at a low level and some genes at a high level or vice versa and control which of our final products is produced. And the implication is that if we can control the levels of the enzyme in that pathway, we can prevent intermediates from accumulating that would increase the cost of something like artemisinin. Now, we chose this specific metabolic pathway because we could actually look at the colors of the cells. So we took CRTI and CRTY, two of the enzymes in that metabolic pathway, and we placed them in an operon. And between those two genes, we placed the RNA site and various hairpins to 
control the stability of this CRTI. So our goal is to selectively stabilize CRTI and destabilize CRTY. And now if we look at the amount of lycopene, beta carotene produced relative to the amount of lycopene in this metabolic pathway, by controlling the mRNA stability, we can control the relative levels of beta carotene to lycopene by 300 fold, okay? Just by controlling mRNA stability. And the idea now, as I said, is that we can selectively stabilize the intermediate, uh, the mRNA that encodes an enzyme that will produce our final product so that we don't have uh, accumulation of an intermediate and we can control and have accumulation of our final product, okay? Now, I'd like to talk to you about the final aspect, and that is actually putting the genes into E. coli. Now, a number of years ago, we started with uh, three different terpene cyclases uh, that take FPP and produce a terpene. And these were actually terpene cyclases that people would give us. Uh, it turns out that these terpene cyclases are, are quite valuable because there are a lot of drugs and natural products produced from them. And so most people who clone them don't want to give them to you, but a few people would share them. And uh, what we found universally is that we got very, very poor yields of our final product. And one problem is that a lot of these have rare codons that you don't find in E. coli. And so when we got the... Uh, when we started to work on the amorphodyne cyclase, which produces amorphodyne, that's an intermediate for the production of artemisinin, uh, we decided that we were going to have to resynthesize this gene. There was an additional problem that the researcher who was working on this and published on it wouldn't give it to us. So we actually reverse translated the uh, amino acid sequence in the computer. Um, we made 84 fortimers, and we used the codon usage for E. coli uh, we threw this in PCR, assembled the gene. Um, of course, we can send out and have this done now. Um, we screened, and lo and behold, we got 142-fold improvement by getting rid of those rare codons. Okay? And this is over other native cyclases. So we're getting closer, but we're still a long way off by several orders of magnitude. And so it's clear to us that we're going to have to now alter the supply of intracellular precursors and make many more precursors for that final product. Now, we have two alternatives. One is the non-mevalinate pathway, which exists naturally in E. coli, and the other one is the mevalinate pathway. When we started this work, the, the non-mevalinate pathway hadn't been fully elucidated. So we decided to work on parts of that pathway that were known. And in fact, it was known that three enzymes in that pathway, namely DXS, IDI, the isomerase that isomerizes IPP to DMAP, and the FPP synthase might be limiting. And in fact, this was work done by other laboratories. So we expressed those genes in an operon, um, and we got about a threefold improvement in the production of amorphodyne, our final product, uh, with time. And this is threefold over the non-engineered or native DXP pathway. I'm going to talk about this decrease in a minute in the final product. But that wasn't going to cut it. And since we didn't have all of the genes for that pathway, and even if we did, there are intermediates in that pathway that, that are necessary for growth, we really wouldn't want to disrupt this pathway. If we disrupt the pathway by funneling as much flux through it as possible to our final product, we might disrupt the production of vitamins that are necessary for growth, and therefore we'd get a lower yield. So a lot of what we do is engineering, and is driven by a need or engineering. And adding these to the culture would increase the cost of the final drug. So that's not a good alternative. A better alternative is to take a pathway you know a lot about and place it in E. coli. And the, there are several advantages. One is that none of the intermediates from this pathway are necessary for growth. So we can tune it up or tune it down to our heart's content and not have to worry about the growth of the cell. The second is that acetyl-CoA probably has the most flux flowing through it of any metabolite in an organism, name, particularly E. coli. And a lot of it is actually wasted as acetate in cell culture. So if we could capture that acetyl-CoA and use it to form our final product, uh, we might be able to drive a lot of flux through this pathway. So that's what we did. We cloned five genes from Saccharomyces, two from E. coli, placed them into two different operons, and expressed them. And we got a 30-fold improvement in the production. Okay. Not bad. We're getting close now. Now, I want to talk just a minute about this decrease in the amount of the final product. 
Uh, oh, no, first I want to tell you a little story. <laughs> Sorry, I'll come back to that. The little story is that um, I have this adage, kind of, if a little's good, a lot's great. And that is, can we, if we can get a little bit of our product, can we turn up this pathway and get a lot of our product? And um, the way you can test that is by adding exogenous mevalonate. We did this before we had the full pathway done. So we'd add exogenous mevalonate, it'd go across the cell membrane into the cell and be shunted into our final product. You add more and more mevalonate, you should see more and more of your final product. Now, if we actually don't express the amorphodiene cyclase, we actually take it out of the cells, we got this strange behavior. And that is that as we added more and more mevalonate, the cells actually started to croak. And in fact, they died at very high levels of mevalonate. But when you add that gene back in, that amorphodiene cyclase, in fact, the growth would recover, and they could grow just fine. Well, if you go in and do, take a metabolomics approach, you lyse the cells, you look for all the intermediates, what might be happening, turns out that IPP, DMAP, and FPP are accumulating in the cell. Now, this doesn't seem like it would be a problem. E. coli naturally produces these and accumulates them at a low level. Turns out that high levels of IPP, DMAP, and FPP are toxic. And we think they're toxic because they inhibit or downregulate uh, the production of DXP through some type of allosteric interaction uh, with this DXP synthase. This in turn then inhibits the production of those vitamins that are produced from the DXP pathway. So the moral of the story is that uh, a lot is not great, that it's really important to balance these metabolic pathways. And this emphasizes the need for these tools to balance the expression of multiple multiple genes simultaneously. Now, the final step is to shunt as much glucose through this pathway to produce our final product. And so you can add very rich media, uh, cheap media like LB, terrific broth, add glycerol, and you can, in fact, get more and more of your final product. But I want to talk about this decrease that I've mentioned before and, and what we might do about it. Turns out that when you're running a fermenter with E. coli, or even in shake flasks, the one thing we do if we're running shake flasks is we have a small volume. If we're running a fermenter, we blow oxygen like crazy through them, or air. And in fact, when the cells stop producing morphodyne, it's volatile, and it blows off. It's a hydrocarbon, okay? So it's gonna be lost from the fermentation. Now, there are two ways you can deal with that. Uh, one is you can actually condense it in the outgas. And in fact, you can get pure product out when you can condense it, okay? So we've got pure morphodiene sitting in there. I didn't bring the vial with me. The other thing you can do is you can add oil to the top. Uh, in this case, we added dodecane. And the dodecane actually captures the amorphodiene. It stays in the do dodecane. And then you could easily get it out by distilling it out, which is something chemical engineers do a lot of. But the really important feature is that, in fact, when you capture everything you're making, you're up to about a half a gram a liter. What this means is that from where we started with the engineering, putting in that, those genes that didn't function very well, to where we are now, we're up at about a million fold, okay? We're two orders of magnitude away from where we need to be. And here's where the rubber meets the road, okay? This is the cost of the drug right now. At 50 grams a liter, this will be the cost of the drug, okay? That's a huge difference to people who need it. Okay, now we don't have to stop there. We can look at some of these molecules like flavors and fragrances. We can look at Taxol, for instance. Can we make that in E. coli? Can we make cheap anti-cancer drugs? Now, to do that though, you have to produce GPP, the 10 carbon precursor, or GGPP, the 20 carbon precursor. And actually, there's a simple way to do that. You can take E. coli's native FPP synthase, and you can actually do site-directed mutagenesis of it. And it's really a beautiful enzyme. The way it controls the chain length of the final product is the depth of the pocket in the active site. So this is the FPP synthase, and it's got an amino acid that pretty much blocks or keeps that chain from being extended down into the pocket. If you raise that amino acid up, you get the C10, or GPP. If you lower the amino acid, you get GGPP. If you take it out completely, you get 
C35s, C40s, etc. So short rubber. Okay, and then you can use that enzyme with your engineered E. coli to produce things like myrcene from Arabidopsis, or casbine or antchorine from fungi and castor bean. Okay, so there are a wide range of products that are now opened up by this technology, including taxol, eleutherobin, and this is our next target, prostratin. It's actually in phase two clinical trials as an anti-HIV target. It actually drives the virus out of senescence so that you can use these heart um, drugs to actually kill the virus. And the real problem, one of the real problems in, in treating AIDS or HIV infection is that the virus lays low in the genome for a long period of time. Well, it turns out that prostratin is a pro protein kinase C activator and actually drives it out of the genome, and then you could use some of these other therapies to kill it. What's interesting about this molecule is that the Samoans have been using it for years to treat viral infections. They've been taking extracts of the tree. Um, and a guy named uh, Paul Cox actually uh, found out that they were using this tree, sent part of it to NIH. They analyzed the, analyzed the plant, purified out the molecule, and tried it. What's different about other protein kinase C activators is that it doesn't cause cancer, which most of them do. And that's why they haven't been used to treat HIV. Turns out Paul Cox also saved the forest that contains this tree by getting a mortgage out on his house. <laughs> and this is one of our next targets. So um, in closing, I uh, would like to uh, express uh, the enthusiasm of the people who run uh, Berkeley, both LBL and the University of California Berkeley, there has been uh, a great deal of enthusiasm for synthetic biology. And in fact, Graham Fleming uh, is so enthusiastic about it, he actually started a department of synthetic biology in the physical biosciences division. And this is our website. And if you Google synthetic biology after MIT comes up in the first few, you'll see LBL down there. Um, and in fact, it includes uh, people, scientists from LBL, also from the University of California, Berkeley, San Francisco, and Santa Cruz. Um, and it's an effort to organize efforts around synthetic biology. And we have some opportunities. So uh, for those of you who uh, are looking for um, possible uh, jobs in synthetic biology, we have a divisional fellow that will be coming up. And this is an independent scientist position at LBL, funded for about five years. And um, all of the divisional fellows in the physical biosciences division have ended up being recruited by the University of California Berkeley to be assistant professors, uh, and they've all been uh, very successful. We also have a um, postdoctoral fellowship, um, so any of you who are interested can send me email to either one of these uh, email addresses. I'd like to thank the people who uh, did this work, and in fact, you can see Brian Flegger's uh, poster up out in the, the poster section where he talks about mRNA stability and engineering that. Uh, and I'd like to thank the funding sources, uh, National Science Foundation, ONR, Maxigen Diversa, and the University of California Discovery Grant, both for funding the tools as well as the application. And I'd like to thank the organizers for one of the best conferences I've been at in a long, long time, and you for your time and attention. Questions? Oh, there's one there. Yeah, okay, Sorry, go ahead. Um, Jay, I guess two very quickly. If you, when you look back on it, if you had to do it over again, would you have uh, gone the Arabidopsis promoter route? Uh, you know, did you have some reason for not using something that somebody else had patented? Uh, did it seem like a good idea at the time?